All right, uh, welcome back everybody. So this is the first new uh, video at my new um, place. Uh, so just a quick channel announcement in general. Oh, there might be a little echo in here. There's a very high ceiling. Anyway, um, just a quick channel announcement. Um, probably not gonna be too much uh, hobby stuff in the ne near future. Um, I'm just getting settled in and have some work related and stuff, uh, to take care of. So, um, that's going to be, go, um, you know, obviously be the priority. Um, but, uh, I think the next hobby project I'll do, um, I'm probably going to start the saga war band first. Um, just because I uh, was not able to bring all of my hobby stuff with me and I couldn't really fit all my miniatures. Um, and I didn't really want them going through airport um, baggage stuff, um, even as a check bag, just because I just didn't want to chance it. Um, so I think what I'll be doing when I when I can, uh, gonna um, get get uh, some probably get like some army painter paints or some other inexpensive uh, paints um, and some cheap brushes, and then um, I'll get the Saga Starter War Band. Uh, I, I think I'm going to do Crusades. I'm not sure yet. Um, so I think I'll probably do Saracens to do some Seljuks. Um, or I might do some Crusaders. Not sure yet. Um, I'm going to take a look and see what they have. <clears throat> uh, excuse me. And then um, I'll, uh, I'll decide. They also have some Byzantines, but I think those are for Dark Ages, I think. Um, but anyway, I uh, wouldn't necessarily have to use it for Saga. I could use it for Lion Rampant or whatever. So... Anyway, point is, uh, we'll be doing another project soon, but it'll probably be something more skirmish-sized um, that I can feasibly, you know, do um, in a reasonable amount of time. So anyway, um, with that, uh, today we're doing a book review. So this is um, uh, one of the things I read uh, on my flight. Um, I've had this on my shelf for a little while, and we talked about it in the last stream. Um but I actually managed to finish uh, reading it this time. Um, so obviously late Byzantine army um, from like the end of the Byzantine Empire, Eastern Roman Empire, if you want to be technical. Um, and it's by a historian named Mark C. Bartusis. And this was originally published um, some years ago. Let me look at the publication page. Yeah, 1992. So it's an older book. Um, but you know, nothing wrong with that. Uh, but it's been out for a while. Um, and, uh, it's not really a book. And he says this in the introduction, uh, there's not a huge like discussion of like all the campaigns and battles and tactics in this period. Um, it's more of a history of the, uh, army as like an institution and how it interacts with society, uh, which generally I like, uh, in military history, uh, that's kind of angle, but, um, this one, I, I, I wish there was a little bit more of the tactics and strategy and stuff, but he does, um, talk about some of the different battles they have, especially with the, um, Seljuks and then later some of the Ottomans. Um, and it covers a really big swath of time and it's, um, really well written. It's not overly, um, like dense, like some academic books are just, um, not very well written, like a lot of, uh, um, you know, academic history, history books. Um, just as an aside, one of the, it's kind of a, a tough act to follow because you have, uh, uh, popular historians who, you know, are really good writers and really able to tell a story, but then you look at their research and, you know, it's not so hot or they're, you know, kind of repeating bad history or, or, you know, there, there, or there's no research. That's the really bad end of it. Um, and most of the time it's not because those, those writers are trying to be bad. It's just, you know, they're doing their best and, um, you know, but then you have the opposite issue with some of these, um, you know, academic press books where, you know, the sources used are really impeccable and the research is solid, but the historian is just not a very uh, good writer. Um, so it's, you know, tough act. Anyway, that's just an aside. But this book is pretty easy to read, um, you know, well written. Um, and it goes into obviously what I just said. Um, and we'll take a look at the table of contents real quick, just so you, just so I have a, 
So we go from part one. So you've got, that's the 13th century. So the sort of impact of the crusade, uh, fourth crusade period, um, the instability in the Byzantine government. Um, you have a lot about the mercenaries. That was very interesting. Um, you have the small holding at Pronoia soldiers. Uh, that's more professional soldiers. That's covers the mercenaries kind of again, um, palace guard. So yeah, I mean, it covers like sort of the basics and then the conclusion. So, um, not like a really, uh, not like it's just a pretty big comprehensive, um, overview. Um, so I think this is a really good introduction. I, I actually, um, even though I mostly read a lot of Ottoman history, I actually didn't know too much about um, the Byzantine military. It's why I got this um, in the late in the late period when they were conquered by the Ottomans. I know, obviously, I know the the uh, Turkish side of things, um, but this was really interesting um, because you see, it it really does a good job of showing um, a lot of the problems the Byzantine military had. Um, in the late period. So two things that, um, well, one thing that really surprised me was um, even in the face of the uh, Turkish expansion in, the, in this period, um, the Ottomans never really had a theological doctrine of just war. Like, um, so if you're familiar with the Crusades, uh, or, or maybe you're not familiar with the Crusades, um, you have Urban, the Pope Urban the Ninth, who declares the Crusade, and then He's building off of the earlier uh, sort of discussion in, in uh, Latin, um, you know, in, in Latin Christianity, uh, in, in the Catholic Church of uh, st that starts with St. Augustine of you have, um, you know, you can have uh, just wars of defense, generally speaking, or liberating um, territory that's fallen to, um, you know, well, the, you know, the Saracens or the Turks, you know, or whatever. Um and then you have, you know, unjust wars of expansion and conquest. Um, but the Byzantines, uh, that, that really surprised me. He, he mentions that. They, they never developed that. Um, or, or it was just never something that they thought was a uh, good, just that, good um, theology. Um, and, uh, yeah, just something that surprised me. Um, and there was a few, he, he goes into some more detail about, you know, there's a few sort of uh, generals here and there, and I think he mentions a churchman that does it, um, but it was never really thought of as, as particularly noble in any context, not just um, like in the Western example where you have, you know, like a just war, which would be a crusade, or an unjust war, which would be, you know, one Christian lord, you know, attacking another one. Um, it was really no context because they... they um, looked at the Muslim example of, uh, of their con their, you know, holy war, obviously. Um, and they thought that, you know, well, we can't do that type of thing because that, that then we'd be like them, um, in any example, which any, anyway, just something interesting that the book brought out. And then also, um, you really get a good sense of how disorganized the Byzantines were in this period. So, you know, I think, um, I think a lot of people, when they read about the capture of um, Constantinople by the Turks in the in the uh, 15th century, you know, there's like this thing of like, well, why didn't you know why didn't the Western powers intervene? Wouldn't you know? Wouldn't they, um, you know, wouldn't wouldn't they want to save it? Um, so uh, that that's another video topic. Maybe we'll talk about that. Um, some other time and, and, or there's probably other YouTube videos that explain that a little bit better, but, uh, you know, one of the reasons definitely why they, uh, did not do so well in that particular conflict, um, you know, granted there was a very small amount of territory they possessed at that time, but, um, you know, over time there, they had no, uh, in the Byzantine empire, there was no ever, there was never a, um, like developed system of feudalism. So, like in the, again, to go to compare it to the West. So, you know, you have sort of the, you know, dark ages and quotation marks, but then, you know, over time you have, um, the founding, the, the founding of the, um, you know, Holy Roman empire. Um, and, uh, and then, and, and then just over time, the, the, the feudal sort of institutions in Western Europe become 
um, more clear and developed. Um, and, you know, and it, and it builds actually really, um, stable society where, you know, you have, uh, you know, you, you, most of you probably know, but you know, you have knights and then you have, um, uh, barons and dukes and, you know, and you have a sort of a codified chain of command. Um, and one thing, um, the, the author, uh, Bartusis brings up is, um, you know, some, some of the earlier Byzantine scholarship kind of used these terms in, in the Eastern, um, you know, Greek, Greek context, but he says, you know, there really was never a full system of feudalism that was actually, you know, somewhat codified into law. You had, um, basically there was, um, there were landholders, military landholders, but what he compares it to actually, uh, and this is interesting is the, he compares it to, um, systems in the Islamic world cause it was kind of close. Um, but it, but at the same time, it wasn't nearly as well developed as, um, like, uh, he mentions, um, in like earlier Islamic, um, empires like the Umayyad or Abbasid Caliphate, where you have the, it's called the Ikta, I think in uh, Arabic. So, um, you're given an estate, uh, or no, you're not given an estate. Um, I'm trying to think about it, explain it. So it is sort of feudal, but instead of you being given a title, say like, okay, um, you know, I'm, I'm okay. Exodite. You're now the, um, Duke of whatever, you know, land of, uh, you know, whatever County. Um, and, and then you pass that to your son um, so in the Islamic world, it would be, you're given the rights to use this either territory piece, you know, piece of land, or, you know, maybe it's, um, a tax farm. So, uh, like I'll just talk about the Ottomans cause it's, cause I can explain that a little bit better. So early on it would be, okay. Uh, you know, Exodite, uh, Bay, you're given this little plot of land as a Timar holder, um, you know, you have the rights to the people, to, um, you know, the agricultural income you derive from it. Um, but you don't actually own it. You're just sort of leasing it from the Sultan. And then later, you know, or, it, you know, in other contexts in Islamic history, it's the same, same kind of idea, except, okay, you have the, the tax farm to, um, you know, wool or wine or something like that, but you don't own that. It doesn't get, you know, on it. Uh, you know, it doesn't get passed to like your son or anything. Um, so that's kind of a long winded explanation, but they, they kind of had that in the Byzantine empire, but it was never fully, uh, implemented, uh, and it was never done in sort of a coherent way. Uh, so that was a big issue throughout this period of, they didn't really develop either institution fully, either feudalism or, or like a, uh, Tamariot kind of system. Um, and so it, it didn't really, it wasn't really that well developed. And he also explains a lot that a lot of the uh, sources for this period are just not super clear. So obviously he cites, um, cause this is a pretty impressive book. He cites, you know, tons of these, um, I mean, a lot of secondary sources, but also a lot of, um, uh, Greek texts and Greek, uh, secondary literature, um, and, uh, you know, so he says a lot of, a lot of, it's, there's several chat, there's a few parts of the book where he says, you know, in this period, you know, we don't really know that much, uh, especially like in the late, you know, late the 1400s, uh, time frame. Um, you know, he's just like, we don't really know. Um, and so trying to like get clear lines, um, on like what was going on in, in such and such period is, you know, we can't really know for sure. Um, which related back to my, back to the point I was making about the, uh, lack of like a feudal structure or any kind of, um, you know, organized fief structure, um, that that's one of the areas where the sources are kind of hard to work with, or, or there's just the, the explanation isn't fully there. Um, and, uh, and, and they did, but on the other hand, they did use a lot of mercenaries. So I was actually really surprised. I didn't know this. Um, and maybe some of you, some of y'all that are into medieval history might probably knew this, but, uh, they used a lot of Western, um, Latin, uh, mercenaries that went there, uh, to fight. So there's the Varangian guard that was, that's obviously kind of famous. 
Um, but there were a lot of Western knights that served in the, in the uh, Byzantine army as mercenaries. Um, and he said, some, and, and in a lot of cases, they would acculturate to becoming Greek. Uh, and that's kind of related to another discussion in the book where he has um, people that, you know, lived in the empire and were subjects, but weren't necessarily part of the, uh, you know, Roman, you know, Eastern Roman, Greek, uh, you know, I'll just say Eastern sort of like ethnos. Um, but he, so he also says, you know, a lot of these mercenary types uh, would... Uh, you know, over generations, you know, they would settle in and then, you know, second or third generation, their children would be considered part of the uh, nation. Um, so it's just kind of a, not a major part of the book, but just an interesting um, dynamic of how, you know, the Westerners and, and Easterners kind of related and, and being a part of the empire. Um, now, and, and uh, kind of related, that is, uh, or related to that, that is a big uh, feature of this book. You get a, definitely a sense of, uh, they, the Byzantines, uh, definitely considered themselves very distinct from the Western Latins by by this uh, time period. Um, you know, obviously they're Greek speaking, so that's a big sort of difference. But um, you know, very different theology by this point um, in the in the uh, uh, Orthodox or you know Eastern uh, Church, Greek Church, um, and just a different kind of pro cultural, a uh, lot of cultural differences. Um, and, um, I'm trying to think what else, uh, so yeah, and, 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 uh, we, we've looked at the table of contents and, you know, so you can see what's in the book and what it goes over. Um, and I, I think you might be able to find a PDF of this online. I'm not sure I didn't look, um, it's been out for a while though. So I would think there's a, um, there's a, a PDF available somewhere. Um, and he also has an appendix in the back. This was kind of interesting. I hadn't really seen this. Uh, in a book before. Let's see if we can get to it. Um, yeah, so he has an appendix of a list of um, soldiers. Um, and you can pause the video and um, read this um, little section. Um, but it just goes into these different soldiers. Um, and kind of gives a little vignette about their life. So this is interesting. I, you know, I, I've, um, I haven't, uh, really seen this before in a military history book. I'm sure it's been done elsewhere, but I think, um, this is actually kind of inspiring for me personally, I think, because if, if I ever get around to writing a good, um, you know, history book like this, uh, this is something I, I might want to do. It's a nice little personal touch then, you know, to zoom in from like these big, um, we'll just go back to the table of contents real quick. Um, you know, like zooming in on these, like going from like these big sort of institutional discussions, um, to, you know, really personally getting into like who some of these guys were and how they lived. Um, you know, it's good. Cause I, I think in general, some of these history books, you know, when people say like, oh, I just like reading about the common person and then, you know, the exact opposite of, well, you know, nobody, no individuals are important. You know, you got to kind of have balance. And I think this is a good way of doing it where you have the big sort of the big trends and the big topics. But then you also get, uh, you know, those little uh, biographies in the back uh, based on what he found in sources. Um, and uh, oh, and another um almost forgot because the, the soldier topic made me think of it. Uh, also, uh, the main, the main thing I, um, or, or one of the, the main things I, I learned was the, the extensive use of, um, Turkish mercenaries in the late Byzantine period. That kind of surprised me. Um, it, it sort of makes sense given like what happens to the Byzantines after, um, Mainz occurred when they, when the Seljuks defeat them. Um, but, um, and, and I think the, and he mentions also the Byzantines actually outnumbered the Seljuks in that engagement. So it was kind of an embarrassment, but anyway, um, yeah, so there's a lot of, um, civil wars in this period. And, and then, so, uh, they bring in, uh, quite a few, uh, Turkish mercenaries to fight in their, uh, to, you know, they hire them. Um, and then there's also, 
uh, even uh, he mentions there's also even some Mongol, ethnically Mongol mercenaries that fight in the Byzantine army. So it's kind of a really odd um, combination of, of nationalities uh, in, in the army at this period. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, I think I'll wrap it up there. Um, interesting book. Uh, like I said, you can probably find PDFs of it, but it's also on, I checked on Abe Books. I don't remember the prices, but if you go to the stream we did, or I did um, last, the last one I did, I uh, looked it up, um, but this is just more of an in-depth review, and uh, again, really enjoyed it. It's, um, it, it, I was a little disappointed at first that it didn't go too much into the tactics and, and, the, and the strategy and that sort of thing, um, but it is... Uh, it, but uh, by the end of it, I, I really enjoyed it, um, and uh, it, it has a lot of good information. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think I'm going to be wargaming. You know, I might do Byzantines at some point, but um, not a priority hobby-wise, I don't think. Um, I haven't really made up my mind on that yet, but um, I think if you are interested in this period or interested in, um, you know, if you're, if you're into medieval history or the Crusades and you want to see the um, Byzantine angle on things uh, in, in this late, late period um, and leading up to the Ottoman conquest. Uh, very interesting book. Um, so uh, check it out. And then I will tease the next one I will review, hopefully, uh, when I finish reading it. So let's change. We'll just uh, take a look at that. Uh, okay, so the next uh, book I'm going to try and review, I uh, didn't finish this yet, uh, so as you can see, uh, Empire, How Spain Became a World Power. Um, I know a little bit about uh, Spain in the earlier 16th century period as it relates to the Habsburgs, because as you guys probably know, that's big, uh, I really enjoy Habsburg history, um, and it's by Henry Common, so he's a really good uh, historian of Spain. Uh, he wrote he wrote a really good book actually on the Spanish Inquisition uh, that's really comprehensive and it goes after some of the um, like movie misconceptions about the Spanish Inquisition, but he approaches it from a really rigorous, um, you know, like source based approach. It's not like an apologetic kind of thing. So yeah, we'll review this one next. Uh, hope you enjoyed the video and I will talk to you in the next one.